everyone. I am Prachi Gurana and I would like to extend a welcome to all the new people in the group. So today I will be talking on, I will be giving a brief introduction to ADS QCD correspondence. And uh, in hindsight, I will talk about what I mean when I say I work on the holographic model of QCD. So QCD and uh, string theory has been in the same family forever. And uh, therefore, counter to popular belief, uh, it doesn't come as a surprise when we use a variant of string theory, which is ADS-CFT, to understand the dynamics of QCD. However, I still believe that it is very crucial to understand the basics of this correspondence and uh, how it manifests in our project. So we will be working on, uh, we will be talking on the, these contents. We will start from the basics which are the brain. Then we will try to understand uh, where our quarks can go on from the theory. We will talk about energy scales and finally QGP. And I hope it answers some of the questions relating to the origination of the correspondence and um, why ADS. So at any point, if you feel I'm using some words that are not familiar, uh, just interrupt me. So I will not assume a working knowledge of string theory. However, I want us to move forward with two basic facts. Fact number one is that string theory works in 10 dimensional space time. This is also called the super string theory. And fact number two is strings. So what are D brains? By definition, D brains are locations in 10 dimensional space time where open strings end. So we have two endpoints of the string. The endpoints, if they're ending on D brain, the endpoints usually end on, in, on D brain. So a D3 brain is, D, uh, is a D brain sending three spatial as well as one time direction. Similarly, a D4 brain will extend in four spatial and one time direction. Now, if we have a single D3 brain, the low energy excitations are described by N equals four supersymmetry U1 gauge theory. So what I mean by N equals four, it means the theory is supersymmetric, maximally supersymmetric, because we have four uh, supersymmetric charges. Now, if we have ND brains, ND3 brains, which are placed on top of one another, one finds that N equals four symmetric Yang Mills theory is now de described by UM is log U1. So the number of D3 brains decides this N. This theory, the UM theory, now splits into two parts. One is the U1, which is free, and it relates to the center of mass motions of the stack. And the other is SUN, which is interacting and relates to the relative motions of the brain. D3 brains have definite mass per unit and a charge under phi form free stress. What this means is, is that they deform the space-time into a solution of 10-dimensional Einstein's equations coupled to the five form. Essentially, we have Einstein's field equations in 10 dimensions, and D3 brains are a solution to those equations. Now, close to D3 brains, this solution takes the form of a direct product of ADS5 cross S5. ADS stands for anti-degenerative space, which is space with a negative cosmological constant. The duality is therefore between string theory, which is a solution to Einstein's gravity, and like we, right, like we talked about, in low energy excitations, it describes N equals four supernovas in four dimensions. And the four dimension is coming from D3 brain, so three plus one. Now, let's start with understanding the metric of extremal D3 brains in 10 dimensions. Extremal simply means that these, these D3 brains are at zero temperature and uh, the excitations are described by the vacuum of n equals four. So this is the metric in 10 dimensions where H is given by L4 over R4. L, we will see what it means. R is just the radial coordinate. L depends on the number of D3 brains. We will later see that this L is the length of ADS and which is intuited from here. The more number of N we have, the bigger the stack, 
the bigger the length of area space is. This is the coupling of yang mills theory, and this is the Zeji slope parameter. Now, okay. So if you look here, we have two cases. Case number one, when this part is extremely large, R4. R is extremely large than L. In the, that case, we can ignore the contribution from here, substitute one everywhere, and this will just become uh, nine, uh, ten dimensional flat space time asymptotically flat, right? On the other hand, the second case, which is important to us, is when L, R is extremely small than L. What happens in that case is we have a metric that looks like this, which is the direct product of A, B, phi plus S, phi. In this case, what we mean when we ignore, uh, when we ignore one is the fact that we're moving very close to D3 brains. When we move very close to D3 brains, what happens is this metric looks like an ADS5 cross S5 metric. We are so close to the metric that we lose track of the asymptotically flat region. So we're just very close to the D3 brains where the metric is, is taking the form of this. And what this means is that the claim that ADS CFT gives is that the gate theory dynamics built from string on the brain can equally be captured by this geometry. We don't have to take the whole D3 brain geometry, we can just use this, mm -hmm. and it will equivalently describe our dynamics. Now, the next obvious question is where are quarks and gluons? As we know that the strong nuclear force is described by SUN and AQCD, we have N equals three. This N equals three corresponds to quarks, which transform under the fundamental representation of SUN. The fundamental representation of, S of SUN just acts on the vectors of the N dimension vectors of the group. So for QCD, since we have SU3, which means we have three basic vectors given by quarks, which come in three colors. On the other hand, gluons transform under the adjoint representation of SUN. Adjoint representations act on the generators of the group. So if we have three here, the generators become n squared minus one, which is eight, so eight generators, and we all evidently know the eight types of gluons. Now, what happens in terms of the dual theory? The excitations of open strings, like we described, which end on D brains, correspond to gauge particles. So in terms of gluons, gluons first because it's easier to understand. So open strings, we have strings with two ends open. If both the ends are on D brains, on the stack of D brains, does not matter which, uh, which D brain, if the, both the ends are among the stack, they are, called, they are described by gluons. And these strings have, like I said, they transform under the adjoint representation. And similar to what we see in QCD, these strings facilitate interactions between different parts of the brain. On the other hand, for quarks, instead of both ends, only one end of the string ends in the D brain, and the other is on the background. And similarly, they transform under the fundamental representation. The other end of string, so remember the two facts, one of the facts was if we are working in 10 dimensions. In those 10 dimensions, D3 brains are embedded in those 10 dimensions, which are four dimensional. From those four dimensions, one, uh, the end of one of the string, one end of the string is ending on those four dimensions and the other is ending on the background. And that background acts as the environment where quarks exist. Now, let's talk about energy scales. Remember the metric that we found, which was a direct product mm -hmm. of ADS5 cross S5? We make an arbitrary choice. We can choose any radial variable, but here we will choose Z. We can also choose U. Note here, which is important, that Z has the dimension of length, whereas U has the dimension of energy. Okay. So if we substitute Z and only care about 
the ADS5 part of the metric, which is S5, we get a metric that looks like this. From here, we can easily see that the metric will remain invariant as long as this is the scale attached to it. This is known as the conformal scale, which means that this metric is conformally invariant. What we mean by conformally invariant is that our theory remains the same if we change the scale of, uh, of the metric. It does not change. Similarly, that's why this acts as a scale and we can easily see that this is conformally invariant. On the other hand, let's assume we take z to be zero. What happens then? This part blows up, that's fine, but this becomes zero. If in the metric this becomes zero, our space then looks like a Minkowski space. So if we have our ADS space which looks like this, and z goes to zero, remember z was inversely proportional to r, r was the radius coordinate, z going to zero implies that we are now going to the boundary. So at the boundary, when z goes to zero, our metric looks like a Minkowski space. This is what we mean when we say that the string theory acts in the bulk, and at the boundary we have our quarter field theory, which is conformally invariant. However, I would urge you to not use this representation because sometimes it is very uh, misleading. The correct and appropriate way to say is that the whole of ADS5 cross S5 describes our pure space. So now understand this. In our QFT, in n equals 4 super angles, our beta function is 0. Beta function is where g is the coupling, is directly proportional to our energy momentum tensor. If this is 0, our energy momentum tensor is 0. This means, however, this does not happen in QCD. We have a running coupling, which we will see how to rectify. This means our theory is conformally invariant. And the dilations in our QFT act very trivially. Now, one, if you go to the dual theory, one would think that these dilations would act like a coordinate transformation that looks like this. On the other hand, in our metric, if x mu where mu is 0 to, uh, to 3, if we change and it gets an overall factor, our metric will not be invariant. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? To preserve our metric, we can also send r, which was a factor here, to r over k. So if this is scaled by k, this is scaled by 1 over k, then our metric is preserved. This is called isometry of ADS5. So dilations in our QFT is mapped to isometry of ADS5. Now for any finite value of k, this k, any finite value of k, we see that when things are bigger in QFT, in x mu direction, does not matter which direction, if they are bigger in x mu direction, the radial part gets smaller with the same scale. This means that the bigger things are around QFT, the deeper we go in the ADS. The upshot of this is that for large R or U, remember U was the energy scale, it corresponds to UV physics and small r corresponds to IR physics. This tells us that the energy scale in our field theory is encoded in the radial direction of our dual gravitational theory. But now, as we described that G, which is our uh, coupling constant, in QCD it's running. In order to explain that running constant, we cannot just use pure ADS5. We have to break this conformal invariance. A few ways to break this conformal invariance is one of the ways is hard wall, where we introduce a hard cutoff in the radial direction, which, like we described, which corresponds to an IR cutoff in the dual field theory. The other is soft wall, which we use, which Musa and I use in our project, is where we introduce a smooth potential in the radial direction of ADS that suppresses the contribution of large distances. This model introduces a dilaton field that grows in the IR, effectively generating an IR scale and thus breaking conformal invariance 
softly. Thus, the name soft work. So now our action becomes a sum of action for ADS5, deltone, and the interaction between the deltone and the gauge field. So this part is ADS5, deltone, and the interactive term. And there are also a few other methods, like we introduce a deformity in the ADS5. Uh, but again, every every method to break conformal invariance comes with its own problems and perks. For our case, this acts very well because then we can introduce our conserved charges. So now, to in order to have more validation and understand QGP in uh, ADS safety, so ADS safety predicts a universal bound on for the shear viscosity to entropy density. And that lower bound is given by this. I do have a derivation that essentially gets this relation, but I don't think I will be having time. If anyone's interested, they can just talk to me. So, and the QGP formed in high energy heavy ion collisions at RIC and NSP behaves like a near perfect fluid. And the experimental data suggests that the QGP forms the ratio of that the ratio of shear viscosity to entropy of the QGP form is very close to that ADS safety bound. The smaller that bound is, the more uh, the more perfect the liquid is. So now, what is it doing for us? If you all remember, uh, in in my last presentation, I talked about how the duality works. If on one side we have a a uh, conformal field theory or a quantum field theory, and on the other side we have ADS5. And mm -hmm. if we want to see how we map QGP to ADS5, mm -hmm. we have QGP at a certain temperature, at high energy and high temperature, and when we map it to the ADS using this correspondence, we see that we have a black hole in our ADS5. And we have many different kinds of black holes depending on the temperature that we have our QGP at. Thus, ADS safety provides a framework for studying QGP by mapping those dynamics to black hole physics in the bulk. This ratio is linked to the horizon of the black hole in the gravitation dual, making it a key observable in theory and experiments. Okay. So in conclusion, what do we have? We have we use this gauge string duality to understand confinement, which we talked about. In order to get confining gauge theory, we will need to move away from ADS. We will need to invoke conformal invariance breaking, and then we can define confinement. And we also have finite temperature non-abelian plasmas, which we use this to describe. And the perk is that we use a more quantum field theoretical point of view to understand our theory. And the descriptions of confinements are extremely elegant and geometrical, and the connection to hydrodynamics is relatively simple. What we don't have is asymptotic freedom, which is poorly understood, and gauge string constructions also lead to parametric mismatch between the mass gap and the flux Q tension. People are working on this, and along with this, Future developments include using black holes to study thermalization in QGP. Since we can map QGP, it, is, it should be uh, straightforward to understand the thermalization process. And we would also like to understand confinement from the perspective of entanglement entropy in holography. Thank you. Question.